Shabu Atovu Mevorach to everybody today, Tuesday, the second day of Shabbat, corresponding to the 4th of January 2022. Today's uh, class dedicated by Mr. Albert Aides, Le'ilu Nishmat, his beloved mother, Nisha, but fortune, as well as by David Rabani, Le'ilu Nishmat, his father, Emmanuel Rafael Hai Ben Hana, as well as breakfast for the entire weekend class, graciously sponsored by the Falak family, the Eloi Nishmat, the beloved father, Ezra Ben Sarah, Mr. Earl Falak. Every time you use the sink outside to the left, it's already paid for, Matchat, I'm not reselling it. <laughs> Thank God, we're working on a new one now, but don't worry about it. Thank you. Uh, upstairs, hopefully. But uh, it's a definitely a great uh, opportunity to reciprocate in the week of the Yard Side uh, for his holy soul. So today, I'd like to begin switching perhaps some of the topics that we have discussed in the early part of this week and talk about Pesach. If you plan to come back to Pesach to Florida, tickets today are almost $800. Wow. From New York? From New York, round trip. Oh, round trip, trip. Oh. yeah. They, everybody's coming to the Safra Synagogue. And you the know, supply and double. demand. Supply and demand, <laughs> right? And the hotels would have doubled. Yes, unbelievable. But on a more serious note, if you're going to be here Pesach, my suggestion is start getting your tickets now. No. Don't wait. And uh, yes, 60 some dollars. I think there is a special going around, but take advantage of it. Um, but the reason I started the class with Pesach is because in this week's Torah portion, we are going to be discussing Pesach. Yes, Perashat Bo, the beginning of the Perashat discusses the plagues, the final three plagues that will come to the Egyptians, hence the name of the Perashat, Bo El Paro. Bo, the numerical value of the word Bo is Bet and Aleph three. So the Torah is hinting me that three final plagues will be coming to the Egyptians. But another beautiful explanation, instead of the Torah says, go to Parao, lech el Parao, the Pasuk says, bo el Parao, come to Parao. And the explanation given is that Akadosh Baruch Hu goes with the person. Akadosh Baruch Hu is with the person constantly, and that's why the Pasuk says, bo, Bet Aleph, Moshe, and Aharon. Bet Mehila to Moshe and Aharon. And Aleph is for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. This is the title of the Perasha. Very basic, superficial explanation. But let's flip the pages of the Perasha. The Perasha begins with the Mitzvah of Rosh Chodesh. A Chodesh Lachem Rosh Chodeshim and we go through the laws of the Korban Pesach, and finally we come to the Masa, the Matzot, the wheat in Pesach, and the golden seal of the Perasha is Kadeshli Kol Bechor. This is the two Perashiot of this week's Perasha at the end, mm -hmm. are two Perashiot of the Tefili, mm -hmm. because in this Perasha, we also learn about the Mizvah of Tefillin. I'll give you this synopsis to understand what's flying in today's perasha. But I'd like to concentrate for a few moments on the message from the Zohar of yesterday connected to the Zohar of today. So the introduction of the Zohar of yesterday explains as follows. Hames and Matzah. In certain aspects, are exactly the same. Both of them made out of flour. Mm -hmm. Both of them contain water. One basic difference is that when it comes to make bread, you add additional ingredients. When it comes to make masa, it's flour and water. That's one of the basic differences. And there are more differences, but we're not baking matzot today, so we don't have to go to the halachic details of it. But there is also one aspect, the aspect of time, meaning to say 
anything done below the 18 minutes mark is considered matzah, anything that crosses the 18 minutes is considered hames. The matzah is flat and thin. The hames is heavy and full of earth. The Zohar Kadosh explains, and I'm giving you the short version so we can expedite a lot of information to share. The Zohar Kadosh explains that this, in a way, represents the Yeser Atov and the Yeser Ara. The Yeser Atov is represented by the Matzah that is thin and there is representing humility, so to speak, and the Yeser Ara is represented by the thickness of the bread. That's why the bread, it has air. That's ga'ava, that's arrogance to a certain extent. For the people say, full of air. That means ga'ava, a deficiency. The matzah is thin. And that means the essence of humility, anava. Now, this all explains the following. What was the purpose that we came out of Egypt? And the Zohar says, don't think for a moment that the purpose that the Jewish people came out of Egypt, it was to take over the world, which this, it's a line utilized in anti-Semitism comments, God forbid, but if you follow a bit of history, Germany, Inquisition, Progroms, uh, LA 2021, these comments are basically saying the Jewish people have one goal, take over the world. The Zohar Kadosh says completely the opposite. It says, don't think for a moment that there is any hidden agenda for the Jewish people and the world. The Jewish people came out of Egypt in order to become a free nation to serve Hashem. We know in the missionary department, God forbid, but all the religions are in this type of search. What's the idea of missionary, God forbid? What's the whole idea of missionary? They bring customers. We don't look for customers. <laughs> we don't look for new customers. The opposite. <clears throat> Somebody wants to become a new customer, we tell them, Oh, Relax. <laughs> Other religions is the opposite. But obviously today the class is not about discussing other religions. That's not the purpose of the class. But it's actually to discuss the Zohar Kadosh that explains Kili B'nei Israel, the Jewish people are mine, so to speak. That says, what does it mean in our mind? For the Olam gave us the Torah. And that's what we say every day in the morning prayers in the Birkot Shahar, right in the beginning. What do we say? Asher baharmanu mikol ha'amin venatalano et torato. Everybody knows this, that Hashem selected us from all the nations and gave us His Torah, Baruch atah Hashem, noten ha-Torah, the one that is giving us the Torah. And someone asked, why don't you say Natan HaTorah, the one that gave us the Torah. At the end of the day, the Torah was given to us over 3,334 years ago. Mm -hmm. Exact. Yeah. 3334. Sounds like a cash four number. <laughs> if you win, remember where the blessing came from. <laughs> you don't know me yet. <laughs> you just got to know me now. Beautiful. Okay, I'm a nice guy. Anyway, Baruch Hashem. So imagine yourself. Why the Torah says, not in. One thing is that gave me the Torah, or that is giving me the Torah. Short answer. Every day, the Torah is given to us again. And how do we activate this aspect? The Pasuk already says, Hayom in Bekolo Tishmao. Beatema Devekim Bashem Elokechem Hayim Kulechem Hayom. You want to guarantee the eternal life? And when I mean eternal life, obviously I'm not referring to human life as an individual, 
because the Torah gives those limitations. But the essence of Am Israel, how did we survive so many tragedies, so many calamities, persecution, anti-Semitism, terrorism, inquisition, pogroms, world wars? How did we survive? Short answer, Devekut. Devekut. We bond with Akadosh Baruch Hu. Sometimes more, sometimes less, sometimes less. But at the end of the day, as long as the flame, the fire is burning, as the Pasuk writes, the Neshama is ignited, connected to Akadosh Baruch Hu. The Zohar Akadosh tells us a very interesting concept. During Pesach, we know that when it comes to Matzah, or Mechila, when it comes to Hames, there are a few restrictions. One of them is, don't eat Hames. Hazako Baruch, everybody knows this. Another restriction is, don't own Hames. Another restriction is, don't see Hames in your domain. Meaning to say, that we must put the Hames away. Everybody does this. I'm just reminding myself on everything that we do. And on top of that, what do we do? We sell the Hames just in case. And the Zohar Kadosh explains that one week that the Hames is put away, it gives the person the strength of connection with the Kadosh Baruch Hu. That's why the Zohar gives two names to the Matzah. Two different names. We call it Matzah. Lechem Oni. The, poor, the bread of the poor. That's why you break the matzah in half. But I don't know why you call it poor bread. Bread costs you $3 a, a pack of pita, and matzah costs you $30 a pound. So if you make the number, it doesn't make sense. Right? Okay, so in a more serious note, don't worry. Whatever you spend for your talk, for Shabbat, for Shodesh, for the education of your children, it's not part of your yearly income. That's what the Gemara writes in Masechet Bitzah, Kol Mezonotav Shel Adam, Ketzuvim Lo, Mirosh Hashanah, Adrosh Hashanah. Whatever the person is going to earn, the person will get, with four exceptions, expenses for Shabbat, expenses for holidays, expenses for Rosh Chodesh, and education for your children. In Mosif, Mosifim Lo. So if a person you know, wasn't aware of this and bought the cheapest matzah in the market, thinking I live on a budget and the person goes the extra mile and buys massage shemura, at least for the seller, which is the proper thing to do. Guaranteed that a Kadosh Baruch Hu will send them a stimulus check. You see? But both matzah is kosher. We're buying massage shemura. One is 30, one is 28, one is 20, they're all kosher. Correct, nobody's so, saying no. But if you buy the $10, five pounds, that means you bought the cheapest. That's what I'm saying. We're talking, we're talking Masashi Murat. So Masashi Murat, but you have to understand the difference. Since you brought it up, I'll bring it up. Go ahead. He's, I think that he's referring at the difference between Masashi Murat by hand and Masashi Murat machine, correct? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. That's what you're referring to, I believe. Yeah. Both of them are kosher. Nobody, God forbid, is saying the opposite. Has shalom. And if I gave you that insinuation, God forbid, it wasn't my intention. Both of them are kosher as long as they have the proper supervision. But Hacham Obadiah Yosef writes that for the seder, and many other opinions, that for the seder, if possible, use the, the matzah by hand. Why? And the question is, why? Short answer. One of the requirements of baking matzah is to do the matzah for the sake of the mitzvah. That's why if you ever go to a matzah bakery, you can go one in Boca Raton. There is a matzah bakery, by the way, that they do at Pesach matzah mitzvah. You hear the following three words. Leshem Matzah Mitzvah that they do every step of the baking of the Matzah with the Kavanah 
that is for the mitzvah, which is the oraita. <coughs> Remember this. Eating matzah in the seder of Pesach is one of the mitzvot, like putting on tefillin, observing Shabbat, putting a mezuzah, and eating kasher. And actually, I'll tell you a secret. Eating kasher is a global mitzvah with certain rules and regulations. Eating matzah proper is definitely one of the top misvot when it comes to the topic of food. So what's the difference then between machine and hand? Short answer, besides $2 a pound, which is nothing today, okay? But it's actually the kavana injected when you bake the masa in a machine there is no kavana. You want to tell the machine, what, you're talking to Alexa? <laughs> Alexa, I think Siri Alexa, right? Is that another name, maybe? Okay. Alexa, please have kavana to bake matzot. And Alexa says, L'shem yichot kuchar v'yichot shenbeh, v'hinoa. This is one of the basic differences between matzah shemurah by hand and machine. Then comes the next topic, which I'm not gonna dwell to it, uh, is basically the cleaning of the machinery. The cleaning of a machine that makes matzah is much more demanding and tedious than a handmade. A handmade is a handful of poles, tables, papers, aprons, fingernails, and halas. Machine, you have so many, many components. Obviously, I'm not trying to change anyone's life. I'm only telling you what's written in the holy books, and each person follows their tradition or their uh, rabbi. Let's continue with the Zohar of today. So the Zohar asks a very interesting question. If bread is so detrimental spiritually, we're not talking about physically. We're talking about if bread represents arrogance, and bread represents the yes and the Why don't you abolish bread? We don't eat non-kosher food, correct? Right. We don't eat certain types of animals that people eat, right? So why can't we put a new halakha? Don't eat bread. Eat matzah only along. If spiritually the bread is the enemy of the matzah, because the bread represents the yeser around, and the matzah represents the yeser atov, because it's flat, it's humble, reminds us of our existence when we left Egypt, <coughs> why don't we eat matzah all year long? And ban bread. Big deal. Do you feel bad that you don't try, I don't want to be, uh, how do I say, improper, but I'm going to bring an example. <clears throat> Do you feel bad that you don't eat a non-kosher meat? No. No. Do you feel bad that you don't eat ham? Of course. You don't feel bad. Why not? Because, you know, you're a Yehudi, and a Yehudi has a dietary loss that had connections to the spiritual aspect of life. So the Zohar question is, if that's the case, why do we eat bread? Ban bread. This reminds me of a Gemara. When the Beta Mikdash was destroyed, the group of rabbis, they had a meeting. <coughs> they had a meeting. And they started to say, okay, now that the Beta Mikdash has been destroyed, let us establish traditions. So we remember the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash. Today, in our days, in our generation, we have Tisha Av, right? And the days before Tisha Av, we have the 17th of Tammuz, Asara Tevet. Those are three fast days connected to Bet HaMikdash number one and two. When a Hatan gets married, what do we do? We break the glass at the end of the chuppah, 
in other congregations and communities worldwide, they do the ashes in the forehead of the Hatan. That's the tradition in Jerusalem, and I've seen it in action in a Sephardic wedding. Okay, okay, not a problem. And then there is something else called the unfinished home. Have you seen this? That you leave an area on the wall of your apartment or your house unfinished. So this reminds you of the destruction of the Beta Mikdash. So far, so good. The Gemara says, hold on. Let's not, listen to this, let's not eat meat till Mashiach comes. Why? Because the meat is connected to Korbanot. Other Hacham says, no, hold on. Let's not eat bread because part of the Minaha <coughs> offering was bread. Other opinion says, let's not drink wine. Because also was part of the ceremonial. Let's not have oil. Shemen, oil. Water. And eventually comes water. Yeah. Because in the celebration of Sukkot, they will do Nisuchamayim, they will do the water libation, and therefore it says, hold on a minute, if we don't have meat, if we don't have bread, mm -hmm. if we don't have oil, if we don't have wine, if you don't have water, what do you have? Keto diet? Nothing. <laughs> the Gemara concluded exactly what you said. You can live. You can live. Even though you, some people live without meat, for example, but no meat, no oil, no fats, no mayonnaise. When I say oil means no mayonnaise. No oil, yet, no mayonnaise, yes. Mayonnaise is oil. I know I'm halal. I know I know herring. I know you like it with the oil. Especially the sriracha one. Come Shabbat morning, you get to taste it. All right? So the Gemara concluded, no. You cannot do a decree on the kahal or on the nation that is impossible to keep. Can you imagine if we cannot drink water? We can handle it perhaps no wine. But then what are you going to do with Kiddush? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do with Abdallah? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do with Shiva Berachot? Mila Pidyon Ben. So Hachamim came to the realization that although the intentions of these opinions in the Gemara were holy and pure, and remember, many of them saw the destruction of the Beta Mikdash. It's like you talk to a child today, a child that is 10 years old, and you start to talk to them about 9-11. <laughs> they don't, never saw it. We saw it. We saw the pain. We saw the suffering. Or like if we start talking to a teenager today about the Holocaust. Maybe some of you lived through the Holocaust and saw the Holocaust and heard about the Holocaust. But I wasn't around when that happened. I was born many years later. So the only thing I know is what I heard, what I read, stories, documentals, people's, their own stories and their own survivals. But as the years go by, survivors of the Holocaust are diminishing. I don't know how many today they are in the world of the people that went through the Holocaust. So the Gemara, the Zohar concludes and it says, although your intention of why banning bread spiritually makes sense, but the Zohar says no need, no need, no need to ban bread. And I repeat, I'm not talking about from the health perspective. I'm talking about the spiritual angle of it. 
So the Zohar says, one week that your body is hames free, <clears throat> one week of hames free zone, it gives us the power all year long to wage the war against the Yeserara. That's why the Zohar calls the Matzah with two different names. Michla de Asuta, Michla de Hemenuta. Translation. Michla means machakel, food. Michla de Asuta, the food of healing and the food of emunah. That's the matzah. And that's why in the week of matzah, the hames needs to be gone from the world, meaning from your world. Mm. And your world means your home. You don't eat hames, you don't sell hames, you don't derive benefit from the hames, you don't even see the hames in your domain. If your wife in Hola Moed sends you to the supermarket and she says, Aharon, or Harry, buy me six tomatoes and four apples, and you happen to walk by the aisle, right? That there is hames, it's not a problem for you to look at it. Why? Because the hames is not yours. So if it's not yours, there is no prohibition. Another thing that we're going to discuss in this week's Torah portion is the beautiful tradition of Mish'arotam. You know that, right? In the night of Pesach, what do we do? We take the Masah. Mish'arotam, Serurot, Desiplotam, al Shechmam. Ute Israel Asu, Kibar Moshe. This is from this week's Perasha. You can really say that because you're from Egypt. Okay, me too. So I'm not sure who else, but there was a obviously some man. Ma'asalame, hazaw aruk. You stayed over time today. Beautiful. Good seeing you. Understand? Jerusalem. And we ask at the end of the Mishalotam, where are you coming from? From Egypt. Where are you going to? Jerusalem. Why are you having? Why are you carrying? And then you say, So the night of Pesach is also known in the Torah as Lel Shimurim, the night of protection. The night that a Kadosh Baruch Hu, Lichbodo Be'asmo, comes down to the world. The Zora Kadosh says, What God does in the night of Pesach? Short answer, he comes to the houses of Am Israel to see and to hear the Seder. How B'nai Israel, whatever we are in the world, we do the Seder of Pesach, which that by itself is a class by itself. How every step of the Seder is not only just the historical scenario behind it. But actually, every step of the seven, it teaches us a different level of godly service. I'll give you one or two because I'm already talking about it. The first thing is Kadesh. Kadesh means what? Make it douche. But what's the deeper meaning of the word Kadesh? Kadesh asmecha. A Yehudi must aim for holiness. How do I increase my Kedusha? Minimum requirement, which is not negotiable, is kosher food. Besides kosher speech, and kosher books and kosher music is kosher food. Because the food is not only the body. The food, the way the Perashah says it in Shemini, it's also for the spirit, for the soul of the person. So now that I know 
what's my goal in life, Kadesh, I need to aim for holiness. Aiming for holiness, obviously, is not limited only to eat kosher food. Because many people eat kosher food, but they do a lot of other things. The short answer means that a person finds different ways in their lives how to develop a stronger bonding with God, which at the end of the day is the pasuk that I quoted before. Be'atem at devekim ba'ashem elokechem. It says a person becomes dabuk. Dabuk. Dabuk means glued to. That's why there is another word that is not a happy word. It's called dibuk. What's the meaning of the word dibuk? Dibuk means when a spirit penetrates the body of a human being. <clears throat> is possessed. Have you heard of exorcism? You know what that means? Yeah, we don't believe that. I know you don't believe, but I want you to I want to tell you a secret. That is a Jewish concept. The book is a Kabbalistic matter. Thank God it doesn't happen often, but going back many years and even previous centuries, the word Saddikim and the word Hachamim that there were experts of how to remove a ill spirit from a living person. And this refers usually to neshamot, souls, that unfortunately, they had a lot of debt when they left the world. When I mean debt, I don't mean credit card debt, all right, or mortgage. It means spiritually that they, they committed so many transgressions and they had so many spiritual damage that even Gehinam, they were not welcome. Those are souls that roam through the spheres. We don't understand, thanks to our holy rabbis, this matter, I like to say, is obsolete. Although we have heard that there was a case maybe 20, 25 years ago in Israel and great holy rabbis were involved in this matter, but don't think too much about it. But interesting enough, it's the same word. I say the word dibuk, it means something almost tragic. And I say dabuk or debekut, it means something very holy and very special. Why? Because they both cling to something. The dibuk clings to the person's spirit, to the person's body, that's why in the, in the, in the world of the bookim, so to speak, if you ever read books or stories about it, one of the things that happen is that a person really does not have control of their body, no. right? And also they talk in a different way. They talk in ways and in sounds and in voices which is not their norm. Why not? Because this is not the one talking. The one talking is the foreign illegal alien that enter the spirit or the body of this individual. I'm not trying to frighten anyone. I'm just only creating an awareness of the same word can mean something traumatic and problematic, literally and dangerous, or can develop a strong bonding with a Kadosh Baruch Hu. The question is, to where the person gravitates to. Do we live and we act and we think in a godly manner, so to speak, in a way that connects us with Hashem, or God forbid, the opposite? So I think that we reviewed this topic, uh, uh, this message, a while back, and one of the messages of the Musar day was, Ma'asecha yekarebucha, ma'asecha yerahakucha which in English means our deeds, my deeds, brings me closer to God, or has shalom, my deeds can increase the distance between God and I. The Zohar says that one week of Pesach, that we clean our body, our soul, our homes from the Hames, and Rabbeinu Ha'ari, gives a guarantee 
כל הזהיר, whoever is meticulous in the most minimal aspect of חמאס in פסח, now the person has an extra insurance policy. And that's why we burn the חמאס out of פסח. And what do we say when we burn the חמאס besides the קל חמירה? We say especially אי רצון. And we say the same way that I was able to burn the physical חמאס, enable me to remove and to burn the spiritual חמאס that is in my soul. Because the חמאס in the neshama of the person, it builds up. It's like, like, like grease. You have grease traps in the restaurants, right? What do you have? A grease trap. Or sometimes in the air conditioning, the pipes are clogged because of residue, right? That happens in condominiums sometimes. Depends which floor do you live at. If you happen to be on the lowest floor, so you're going to get a lot of residue from the entire piping system. So what do you need to do? You need to call the plumber or the air conditioning. What they need to do? They need to, to clear the arteries, the veins. They need to clear the pipe. They need to clear the hose. They need to clear the air conditioning pan, right? So take all those examples into your neshama. <laughs> That's it. Clear enough? Beautiful. <clears throat> okay. The Musar is heavy. Heavy. You owe us the Musar from yesterday. I know. That's yesterday's Musar. <laughs> Still heavy. Didn't change. It's keeping record. Okay. So I'll tell you in summary. Remember a few moments ago, I quoted one of the blessings of the morning prayers, which is the Beracha for the Sefer Torah. Asher baharvanu mikol amin. That Hashem selected us from all of the nations of the world. Benatan lano et Torato. He gave us His Torah. Now, so we understand right away, and I need to say this to introduce the Musar of today, that we are different than the rest of the world. Like it or not, the Torah creates a separation. The more a person is connected with Hashem, the less chances of assimilation, God forbid. But the less connection with God or the Torah, assimilation, God forbid, God forbid, can become a real threat. We know that there is assimilation in the world, but we have our guard up. We have our fences of protection. And we know, hopefully, where to draw the line. I can do X, Y, Z, but I don't cross certain lines. The line of today's crossing the Musar talks about, God forbid, God forbid, when a Jew becomes involved with a Gentile woman, with a Goya. We're not even talking about marriage. That's obviously forbidden and it creates a lot of domino effects at all levels. But here, the way the Musar of today discusses is not talking about marrying a Gentile. He says, even if God forbid, God forbid, a Jew went with a Gentile woman, that is also a major avon, a major trans a transgression. Why? Because a Yehudi has Kedusha, has holiness. 
that holiness is built by the Torah, by the misvot, by our behavior, by our ma'asim tovim. Goim could be wonderful people, clean people, presentable people, but the absence of Torah and a society that everything goes <coughs> and everything is permissible, that creates a mega distance between the ideas of the Torah. So the Musar of today says, don't think that the prohibition is only marrying a Gentile, but being together with a Gentile is also forbidden. And that's why the Torah, Halakha, puts many fences, fences, barriers. For example, don't eat with goyim. Don't mingle with goyim. Don't celebrate with goyim. Don't eat food cooked by goyim. Now, why not? Because once those boundaries are crossed, the friendship and the social pressure, God forbid, God forbid, can lead the person to do more. And even though you may say, Rabbi, I know where to draw the line. Guess what? There were many people who knew where to draw the line, and yet they failed. That's why the Gemara writes, En apotrophos la arayot. You back? This is not sitting there. I forgot. <laughs> Give me a break, seven, eight months. <laughs> Anyways, en apotrophos la arayot. What does it mean? When it comes to morality or immorality, so to speak, there is no insurance policy. You cannot say, I know, I know how to control myself. The Gemara says there is no such a thing. Once the Yeserara is active and is dancing, God forbid, can lead the person to act in ways which are inappropriate. As the Pasuk writes in Malachi, Ki hilel Yehuda kodesh la'ashem uba'al bat el nechar. A Jew caught their umbilical cord from connected to God by becoming intimately involved with the Goya. Let's clarify for the audience, because we have the physical audience and we have the virtual audience. And in the virtual audience, we have male and female audience. So let's clarify one thing that the Avon is the same, male to female or female to male. Let's clarify. In other words, although we concentrated based on the text of the Musar of yesterday that refers a Jew becoming involved with a Gentile woman, also there is a serious halachic and spiritual problem that a Jewish lady becomes involved with a Gentile man. And that both of them carry, how do I say this, spiritual consequences. As much as halachic consequences. Understand? Now, the Musar of today, or yesterday, continues and it says, we had an individual by the name of Zimbri ben Salu. Remember him? Zimbri ben Salu was the leader of the tribe of Shimon. The story with Binhas. What happened with him? He was, the Gemara tells us, 250 years old. And he was mentioned in last week's Torah portion, by the way, with a different identity. You know how was he called in last week's Torah portion? Shaul ben Kenaanit. Shaul, the son of a Kenaanite woman. Who was he? According to the holy books, he was the daughter, the son of Dinah. 
the son of Dinah. And he was given a different name. Shaul ben Akena'anit here. And later on, we call him Zimbri ben Palu. Oh, yeah, Zimbri ben Salu. Mechilalu. Sheba al Kosbi Batsur. That he was intimate publicly with this non Jewish lady, the daughter, okay, of the king of Midian, the daughter of Balak. But Pinhas, the famous Pinhas came and got rid of them. This is what Pinhas did. What did Pinhas do? He needed to activate judgment on the spot. Because God forbid that action of Zimbri ben Salu, it brought a disaster to the Jewish people. The 24,000 members of the tribe of Shimon perished that day. Sure. Perashat Balak. Look in Sefer Ramidbar towards the end. And look Perashat Pinhas. And it says, the Musar of today, that unfortunately, if you look out in the Yakut of the Shofetim, there was never, from this tragic moment, that any leader of the tribe of Shimon had a national position for the well-being of the Jewish people. Yani, they, 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 they pay the price mm -hmm. for causing such a tragedy among the Jewish people. And it goes further, and it says that God forbid, God forbid, this type of behavior in which God forbid the Jew allows himself to be with the Goya. Or I'll tell you one more thing. Even to be with a Jewish woman is forbidden. The Goya, there are more consequences. But with a Jewish woman, let's say Jewish men, Jewish women, technically they're both kosher to marry, correct? But you cannot be with her Unless because she's not your wife. Right. So you're entering somebody else's domain, the Zohar says. She's not yours. She's not your wife. That's why and I spoke about this maybe two weeks ago, in the observant aspect of the community. Observant means religious. When they date, there is something called what? Shomer Negia. When they date, not touching. Because touching leads to, leads to exploring and physical reactions, hormonal reactions, and then you know the rest, what could come back out of it. That's why you keep your hands to yourself. That's why you keep your hands to yourself. You're dating someone, you keep it to yourself. Respectful, tactful, let the love build, not on the physical, but on the emotional and the spiritual. Once you're married, it's a whole different story. But even when you're married, there are guidelines. She's Tehora, or she needs to go to the mikveh. But that's stage number two. That's stage number two. Get married first, yeah. and then you know the loss of family purity, etc. But before that, for safety, for spiritual well-being, even though that a person may say, Rabbi, don't worry, I use protection, wow. no pregnancy. Okay, because many times people say, no pregnancy, I'm careful. But that's also forbidden. Of course, the person is wasting 
something holy that needs to be earmarked, earmarked for your wife mm -hmm. with a stranger. So the Avon is there. Any way you look at it, any way you look at it with a Jewish single lady or with a, 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 a non-Jew, God forbid, both of them are forbidden and both of them carry a line, a list of prohibitions. Some of them are more strict in one than the other. Some of them are more strict in the other and not the other one. But at the bottom line, bottom line, bottom line, bottom line, the Musar concludes and it says, don't fool around. Right. Keep your holiness proper with your spouse, with your wife. Don't look for adventures. Don't try new experiences, God forbid. I'm sorry to speak so openly, but uh, we have a varied customers, <laughs> including Gentiles, based on the questions that I get. Sure, guaranteed. And that's why the loss of morality is not limited only to the Jewish people. The loss of morality, the seven Noahide universal laws, it also includes Goim. Goim means Gentile, non-Jew. Okay, my good friends, for the Spanish class, <laughs> for the Spanish audience, in itorah.com, empezamos la clase Be'ezat Hashem en aproximadamente 30 minutos. All right, for the audience here, remember tonight, we're going to be welcoming Rabbi Tuvi Ben Shushan. Oh. Yes, tonight in person, and hopefully we'll have him tomorrow morning for breakfast and class no, here. Tonight, 8.30 approximately. Hopefully the flight is on time. If not, you have to hear me again. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>